Good morning, everyone. Cool, first talk of the day. So uh, hi, I'll start by introducing ourselves. Uh, my name is Akshay Cannon, and I'm a product manager on the Android Auth team. I'm Felipe Leme. I'm software engineer in an Android frameworks team. Hi, I'm Simranjit Singh Kohli. I'm software engineer in Android authentication team. And our talk is all about Android APIs that you can use to improve sign-in, payment, and other key forms and experiences in your apps. So let's dive right in. Why are we giving this talk? What are the goals we want to accomplish with this? The first is to get more apps to use existing data from Android and to avoid prompting your users. Throwing up any kind of blank form in your app, such as an app login or a credit card, can create friction and result in drop off when users don't know this information offhand. We've created APIs for you to automatically get this information when it's available so that you can let your users skip past the step and get right to the stuff that actually matters in your app. Secondly, we'll talk about how you can provide a seamless experience and reduce churn when your users switch devices. Getting a new phone is awesome, but it can also mean that your users get locked out of or stop engaging with your app. Here also, we have a set of APIs to maintain your app state across devices. Let's start by focusing on how you can use existing information that the user has already provided to enhance your flows. The first feature I want to talk about is a new one. You may have heard about this in the keynote. Starting in Android O, we've added native support for password managers. This functionality is integrated tightly into the OS, so you don't have to rely on hacks like accessibility services or custom keyboards in order to securely fill in passwords, credit cards, and other information. We've partnered with Dashlane, LastPass, Keeper, and 1Password to support this feature when Android O goes out this year, and we're really excited about this. Of course, not everyone uses a password manager, but we still want all Android O users to be able to experience the security and convenience of autofill. So for those users, we're introducing autofill with Google. This feature comes bundled with Android O devices and lets you fill in passwords, addresses, credit cards, and other information that you already have saved to your Google account with Chrome Sync, all with a single tap. We've made a preview of this feature available to developers as part of the O beta, which you can play around with today and use to test out functionality for autofilling the logins in your apps. Support for credit cards and addresses is coming later this year, along with the consumer release. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Let's cut to the demo. So let's say that I'm logging into Twitter on a new device. I simply open the app, I tap Login, and you can see here that my username already auto-populates as a suggestion. I simply tap on that, my username and password automatically get filled in, I hit Login, and now, as you can see, I've been able to log into Twitter without pressing a single key on my phone. Next, I'll hand things over to Felipe, who's going to talk a little bit about how this all works and how you can optimize your apps as developers for autofill. Thanks, Akshay. <laughs> Guess the clap was for him or for autofill for Google, but pretty sure it was not for me. Anyway, um, so uh, the Android autofill framework was designed to work out of the box with existing apps without changing the apps to support the autofill. In fact, for our Twitter demo, we just got a Twitter. We just installed the Twitter, existing Twitter app from the Google Play Store, and it just worked without any involvement for the Twitter developers. We hope this is going to be the case for most apps, but we still provide some APIs that you can use to make sure that your app integ integrates well with autofill. We'll see some of these APIs over the next slides. But first, let's take a high-level look on how autofill works because that will make it easier to understand why using these APIs is important. So the autofill workflow involves three processes. In one hand, you have your app, which is the app being autofilled. In the other hand, you have the autofill service, which is the app that has the user data, like a password manager or autofill with Google. Then in between then, you have the Android runtime system, which is a mediator used for privacy, security, and performance reasons. The whole workflow starts when the user selects an editable field on the app, for example, when the username 
view on Twitter was focused. So at that point, there is an out of field infra running on the app process, and that infra is going to create a customized version of the view structure that is optimized for out of field. Then it will send this view structure back to the Android system, where the Android system will sanitize the data by stripping out sensitive values. Next, the Android system sends the data to the out of field service. Now, here is the part where things get interesting from an API point of view. The out of field service will parse this view structure and will look for fields that can be out of field. Then it will look on the user data for that app and see if there is a match. If there is a match, then it creates another data structure called dataset and sends that dataset over to the Android system. At this point, the Android system is able to out of field your app, but it doesn't do that without the user confirmation. So what it does instead, it shows an out of field dialog with the options sent by the service. And only after the user selects an option, we send the data set back to the app. And then the out of field infrastructure will automatically set the views and change the background colors to show that the view was out of field. So this workflow it works pretty fast. It's pretty fast. Like we saw in the demo, the out of field dialog came out almost at the same time as the keyboard itself. But this workflow has a catch. It only works if the out of field service can figure out what can be out of field in your app. Generally speaking, the password managers have good heuristics, and they can pretty much figure out how to out of field almost any app. But they don't want to rely only on their heuristics to make it work. It's better if you can tell them for sure what, what, what can be out of field in our app and how. It's also nice to help the Android system to optimize the workflow by telling which fields should be ignored because they don't make sense to be out of field. You can accomplish both these goals by simply annotating our active XML with uh, out of field tags, as we're going to see in the next slide using a very simple login screen example. Okay. So this login screen has three editable fields. There is a username and password and a captcha challenger. The username and password are the, really the, the, the fields that really make sense to be out of field, while the captcha is something the user has to type in to make sure to prove that the user is a human being, or a tree in this case, and not a robot. So without further ado, let's take a look on the XML. The first and most important tag you can use is called out of field hints. This tag tells the out of field service what is the meaning of our view or what kind of user information they, they, the service can use to fill your view. For example, on our password field, there is only one way, only one way to fill that info, which it is using the user's password. So we say out of field hints equals password. But on our username, our app allows either a username or email address. But we don't know in advance which of these two information the out of field service has. So it's better to give the out of field service a choice. So we, we put all values that possible here. So we say username, comma, email address. The out of field hints can take any string. You could have something as bizarre as my dog's favorite caller while on vacation in California last year during the drought. But these hints are only useful if the service understands what they mean. So we provide constants in view.java for the most common cases like username, email address, telephone number, credit card number, credit card expiration date. So it's better if you try to use these constants instead. The next tag is called important for out of field. This tag is used by the Android system to optimize, what, what's, uh, to optimize the workflow. So basically, it tells the Android system whether the view should trigger the out of field workflow and whether the contents of the view should be included in the view structure, structure that's sent over to the service. So in our example, we can mark the CAPTCHA as uh, the CAPTCHA edited test as important for out of field equals no. That means that when uh, the out of field workflow is triggered by the username or password, we don't send the CAPTCHA over. So this might sound like a small, a minor improvement. But remember, this is running on a mobile environment where every little optimization counts. In fact, there might be cases where the whole activity doesn't make sense to be out of field. For example, in a spreadsheet editor like the one in Google Drive. In this case, you can mark the root view of your activity with the important for out of view equals no excluded descendants. And that pretty much is telling the Android system that no view inside that activity should automatically trigger out of field. Just keep in mind, 
that the important for autofill is an optimization hint and not a way to effectively disable autofill on your app. The user can always bypass your decision, your hint, by manually requesting autofill. For example, the user can long press the text to edit text and then select the autofill option in the overflow menu. And when that happens, not only we trigger the autofill workflow, but we send over all views, including those marked as not important. So this is pretty much the two easiest way you can optimize your, uh, your apps for autofill. There are other tags and Java APIs that you can use, but we didn't have time to show in the presentation. But they are available on the official documentation, on the official docs for the autofill. Now back to Akshay for more tips. Thanks, Felipe. As we mentioned earlier, along with introducing the autofill framework in Android, we're launching our own autofill service that comes bundled with O devices, autofill with Google. One of the nice things about autofill with Google is that your data is synced between the Chrome browser and the mobile apps that you use. In order for this to work, you need to claim the association between your mobile app and your website. And you can do this using digital asset linking. If you've used other things like app linking in Android, you might be familiar with this already. Basically, for autofill, this enables any web logins that are saved using Chrome to, to work with mobile apps and vice versa. And basically, in order to make this association work, there's, there's just two steps involved. So the first step is to host some JSON on your web server at your domain slash dot well known slash asset links dot JSON. And this tells us about the mobile apps that are associated with your domain, along with the permissions that you want to share with those apps. Uh, here, you, you explicitly define the permissions that you want to have shared. Uh, so in this case on the slide, uh, there is the common dot get login creds permission which uh, enables your credentials to be shared from your website to your mobile app. Um, and in, ad in addition to credential sharing, there's many other permissions that you can also grant to your app using this same JSON. For example, there's also the handle all URLs permission, which lets your app handle incoming web links via app linking so that your users can seamlessly open links that your app was designed to handle. The next step. Once you've hosted this JSON on your server, is to define the corresponding association in your mobile app. And you can do this by modifying your app's manifest. To enable credential sharing, you need to add the following metadata tag to your manifest. Uh, here, Android string asset statements points to a JSON string resource that contains a list of web targets and permissions, similar to what you hosted on your website. And that's it. With these two steps, you can share credentials between your website and your mobile app. This works for autofill, and it also works for smart lock for passwords, which lets you automatically sign in your users. Now, I'm going to hand things over to Simranjit, who's going to talk more about how you can enable automatic sign-in for your users in further detail. Thanks, Akshay. We want our users to get as much value out of their device as quickly as possible. A lot of that value is associated with their accounts. So we have provided a set of APIs to make user logins easy and seamless. The first one is Smart Lock for Passwords, which was introduced last year. The second one is Account Transfer API, which will be released in an upcoming Google Play Services update. There are benefits to each of them that we will look at as we move on. The first API we discuss here is Smart Lock for Passwords. It allows for automatic sign-in and skipping password forms completely. It syncs with passwords stored in user's Chrome profile. As a result, it persists across app installs. It has some differences from Autofill. While Autofill is only supported Android O onwards, Smart Lock is backward compatible with ICS and delivered via Google Play services. With Smart Lock, users can be logged into your app programmatically without any user input. Here, as you can see in the Netflix example on this slide, user did not have to do anything. They just open their Netflix app. Netflix makes the API call, gets the credential result, verifies the credential with the server, and signs in user automatically. In this case, login, can be skipped login screen can be skipped completely. With autofill, user at least has to tap into the fields in order to populate them. Smart Lock also provides advanced security feature. There are two major flows associated with this API, retrieving credentials and saving credentials. Here's how to retrieve the 
retrieve credentials using the request API. If the credential was already available, you get success on the callback. And you can sign in user immediately, as was shown in the Netflix example in the previous slide. The other cases require user action, which are triggered by launching relevant intent. If the user has multiple credentials, they can pick the credential they want to use. If there are no credential available, they get a dialogue to select email address or phone number to sign in or sign up with. Here's an example of a save API. If the credentials were already saved previously and you are making a call to updating them, the callback results in a success. But to save a new password, the user must give consent for the credential to be saved. In this scenario, you have to call start resolution for result. Additionally, the responses from SmartLog API also includes a signed JSON Web ID token if Google has verified the user's email address. You can use this token on your server to verify user's email address and sign them in without a password. Or you can use it as a strong positive signal in anti-abuse algorithms. Also check out the talk later today on PhoneAuth, which will cover a new smart lock API to verify phone numbers via SMS messages. Now let's talk about a second API, the account transfer API. While setting up your new Android device, you might have seen the following flow, where it gives you an option to copy your data from your existing phone. Initially introduced at tap and go in Lollipop release, this flow allows you to copy your Google accounts from your existing device to your new device. We thought about how we can make it more seamless for our users to get started on their new device. And we came up with Account Transfer API to help transfer non-Google accounts also during the setup process. After you select that you are copying your data from another device, our flow kicks in. As you saw in the previous slide, Account Transfer API transfers credentials during the setup of the device. It's a device-to-device -device transfer. Some organizations don't allow the storage of their users' credentials on our servers due to the nature of their security policy. So in that case, this, I, this API is very useful. Also, there is no dependency on Google accounts. If you are an identity provider, this API provides a lot of benefits. It is only available to Android authenticators. Authenticators are apps which implement abstract account authenticator and integrate with account manager on the Android platform. Account Transfer API provides an encrypted channel between participating authenticators on a user's existing and new device. This encrypted pipe is established by Google Play services running on both these devices. Apps can do two-way communication over this encrypted channel if they are also present on the new device. But if the app is not present on the new device, transfer credentials are held in temporary storage. If your app is pre-installed on the new device, here, it, here is it how it looks. You can send messages from source to target and from target to source, establishing a two-way communication. You can perform key exchanges or perform cryptographic challenge response flows. Google Pay services running on both these devices notifies you of available data on that device via broadcast. However, if your app is not installed on the target device, the credentials sent from your app on the source to the target are stored in temporary storage. When your app gets installed and is opened for the first time, make a call to our API to retrieve the transferred over credentials. To participate in this API, you need to register these broadcasts in your manifest. This slide shows which broadcasts are active on the source and which ones are active on the target. If your app doesn't come pre-installed on any OEM system image, you only need start account export broadcast. Here is a sample code that will be called on your user's source device. When source site broadcast is triggered, you should start a new service. In the service, you first get a handle to the API object, and then send the user credentials in byte format using the send data API. In case there is a failure, notify about it to our API. On the target side, you can retrieve the data that was sent over. 
Here also, when your board cache is triggered, you should start a service. In the service, grab the API object, and then make the retrieve data API call and retrieve the byte data that was transferred over. Convert this byte data to your credentials using your custom logic, and then add the account on the device using Account Manager API. Finally, notify our API about success or failure. This is a simplistic example where only one-way communication is happening. Source sends the data and target retrieves it. This is sufficient for many apps, like apps managing email, IMAP, pop free accounts. The same code can be used if the app is not installed on the target and when the user opens the app for the first time. However, in this case, you can't send the data back to the source. Also make sure not to call this API from your main thread. Now I will hand it over to Akshay to discuss Android Pay and backup APIs. Thanks, Simranjit. So in the last few slides, you learned about how you can automatically sign users in using Smart Lock for passwords, or how you can securely transfer credentials from your old device to your new device using the upcoming Account Transfer API. Similarly, for payments also, we offer a set of APIs to help you get this information automatically on behalf of the user. And similarly, this also extends down to older Android versions, so you don't have to depend on your users running autofill on Android O. Currently, we have the Android Pay API today, which gives you Android Pay cards. But as you heard in the payment session, we'll be introducing the Google, Pl Google Payments API in the coming weeks to extend this API to include all of the cards tied to a user's Google account, not just the ones that they have using Android Pay. And best of all, there's, there's no commission or fees involved at all in using any of these APIs. Uh, to make this work, there's, there's basically three steps involved. Uh, first thing you do is you request a masked wallet. Uh, and that shows the, the, a dialog similar to the one in the screenshot you can see on the slide. And this lets the user pick a form of payment. Uh, once they've selected one, you can handle the response from this and use that to present a final confirmation to your user, confirming the amount, what they're going to be ordering, and the method of payment they selected. Uh, and then once the user confirms this, you can request a full wallet. And what that does is that gives you the credentials that you need to complete the transaction. So that's it uh, for payment APIs. So in the first, whole first part of this presentation, we've talked a lot about using existing information that the user already has provided to speed up critical forms and flows in your apps, whether it's logins or payments or anything else. In the second part, we're going to focus on using backup and restore to reduce churn when your users switch devices or if they reinstall their app on the same device. Even if someone's using a new device, our goal is to make it feel like they never stopped using your app. So as, as we mentioned before, throwing up a blank login screen the first time a, an existing user uses your app on a new device can create unnecessary churn and stop users from re-engaging. If they've already used your app, you can skip your welcome flow, pre-populate login information, and transfer over settings and any other states to give your users a warm welcome and a seamless transition onto their new device. The goal is to preserve as much of your app state as possible so that your users continue to stay engaged. We offer two APIs for doing this. There is the Auto Backup API, uh, which, as you'll see in the next slide, is extremely low effort for developers. It's basically a line of code that you add to your manifest, and it backs up everything in your app wholesale. For more fine-grained control over exactly what gets backed up in your app, we recommend using key value backup. This works on Froyo and above, so pretty much all active Android devices today are supported, assuming a user has backup turned on. We'll talk through both of these APIs. We'll explain how you use them and talk through some of the trade-offs between them. Let's start by talking about the auto backup API. As we mentioned in the last slide, it's extremely low effort for developers to add to your app. You just add this single line to your manifest that you can see on the slide, and everything gets backed up wholesale, including shared preferences, your files, and your databases. In addition, you can also define custom XML include and exclude rules to control exactly what gets backed up. All of this data gets persisted in a private folder in the user's Google Drive account, 
which is limited to 25 megabytes per user per app. This doesn't count towards the user's drive storage, and only the most recent backup ever gets stored. So every time there's a new backup, it overrides the previous backup. That being said, auto backup is limited to Marshmallow and above. And if you want broader support or more fine-grained control over exactly what gets backed up, you're going to want to use the key value backup API instead. The key value, Android key value backup lets you preserve your app data by uploading it to Android's backup service. The amount of data is limited to 5 megabytes per user per app, and it's available completely free of charge. There's basically two steps to make this work. You update your manifest, and then you write the code to do the backup. Uh, in the first step, where you update your manifest, uh, you want to point to the backup agent, uh, which in this case is my backup agent, which we'll define in the next slide. And you want to register for the Android backup service in the API console, which gives you an API key that you can copy paste into your manifest. Next, once you've updated your manifest, you want to actually define your backup agent. Uh, and this is the code that actually does the backup. In most cases, rather than extending backup agent directly, you can extend backup agent helper and use the two included helpers that we've already provided, which are the shared preferences backup helper for backing up shared preferences and the file backup helper for backing up files. In the right, you can look at an example of what this looks like. Basically, in the onCreate method of your backup agent helper, you can instantiate one of these helpers with the name of the file that you want to back up. And then you call the add helper method, which adds this helper to your backup agent helper. If you need further control over versioning, file portions, or databases, you can extend the backup agent directly rather than using our included helpers. So that's backup and restore. In this whole talk, we've discussed a lot of APIs to help you streamline your apps, ranging from logins to credit cards to backup and restore. Our vision with these APIs is to lower the barrier for new users and even existing users on an old device to start interacting with and engaging with your app. We want to move to a world in which your phone knows more about you, and it can provide this information to other apps when you allow that information to be provided to them. We want to make forms a thing of the past. And as app developers, you should be able to tap into information that's already been provided by the user rather than forcing them to type it over and over again just so you can get it. Especially with instant apps, upfront forms can significantly hurt the experience and increase the friction that's needed to try something new. So our, our goal with these APIs is for mundane stuff like credential entry to become a thing of the past. And if the user purchases a new device, we want this information to stay with them and move with them so you don't feel like they're starting all over again. So just to recap the key takeaways from the whole talk, uh, first and foremost, uh, autofill is coming with Android O, oh, as you saw in the demo. Uh, please optimize your apps for autofill. Uh, you can annotate your XML using the hints that Felipe talked about. Uh, and also, you can use digital asset linking to associate your website and your mobile app so that credentials can be se seamlessly shared between the two. Second, populate credentials and payment information automatically when it's available. You can use the Smart Lock API to, to, to back up your username and password associated with uh, Chrome Sync. Uh, you can use the Android Account Transfer API if you need a secure and encrypted pipe during device setup. Uh, and you can use the Android Pay APIs today and the Google Payments APIs in the coming, coming weeks to get payment information from the user without any sort of commission. And thirdly, make sure you persist your app's data across devices. Uh, we talked about the auto backup APIs, uh, which is extremely low effort and backs up pretty much everything in your app. Uh, and for more fine-grained control, uh, we also offer key value backup. So this is a lot of APIs that we talked about today. Uh, we have a short link here on the slide that takes you to a doc where we've provided links to the developer documentations for each of these APIs so you can learn more. Thank you so much for coming out to our talk. Uh, hopefully, you'll check these APIs out and use them in your apps. Uh, thank you so much.